we'll go ahead and get started. I just want to do a few housekeeping things and then we'll, we'll get going. Um, there's some links in your chat to purchase the book at the Raven Bookstore. Um, also a link to our um, online calendar if you want to see what other events we have coming up. And then um, we do have, um, a, I put a link in there to an event on August 31st. It is Civics 101. And it is all about the importance of getting uh, signed up for the, or, or, or filling out your census form. And if you want to learn more about that and how incredibly important that is, um, that is at, that is on August 31st. And there is a link right there in the chat that you can sign up um, via Zoom. We are recording, just FYI, we are recording this. And then book signing, if we are, we're going to do book plates. So Thomas is going to sign book plates. He's going to send them back to me and I'm going to distribute them. So I'm going to put my email in the chat right now. And if you want a signed book plate sent to you, please send me an email. They have to have the book first, don't you think? A book yeah. plate. You know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to sign checks. We're just going to mail checks. <laughs> that sounds good. That sounds good. So yeah, so yeah, if you need if you need a signed book plate, um, go ahead and just shoot me an email right there and then I'll work with Danny to get them in your books. But yeah, do buy the book from the Raven bookstore. Um, they they ship books right to your door. It's super easy. Every if you live in Lawrence or in the area, you can uh, do a very safe socially distanced pickup. So please do buy books from um, a really wonderful local bookstore and make sure that they can keep their doors open during all of this craziness. Um, and just kind of the menu for the evening, we'll have an interview for um, you know, 30, 30 minutes and then we'll hand it over to the Q&A. There's a little Q&A um, button at the bottom of your screen. So if you have questions, please enter your question in there. I'll also be monitoring the chat. So if you have any questions, you can also pop them in the chat. So without further ado, I will pass this off to Brad Allen, who will get our evening started. All right. Well, it is it is truly an honor um, to, to get to do this tonight. I've been um, a big fan of Thomas Frank since uh, since my college days reading The Baffler and, and he's come to Lawrence before and I've seen him in Kansas City. So it's, I, I truly appreciate you taking the time um, to visit with us in this very surreal world of, um, of these virtual uh, author interviews while you're on, on tour from home. Ah, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, for those of you, I, I'm imagining most folks who are here um, know Thomas Frank and, and know his work, but, um, by means of introduction, I, I actually found um, the Thomas Frank FAQ on his website to be quite good. Um, and so uh, th I thought I might try use some of this as, as a way towards introduction. Uh, so who is Thomas Frank anyway? Is he that guy on the south side of Chicago they used to call the Big Hurt? No. Thomas Frank <laughs> is an author of, of books about culture, politics, and business, such as most recent, The People Know, Listen Liberal, What's the Matter with Kansas, and The Conquest of Cool. Many years ago, he founded the Baffler Magazine. Um, these are, uh, that's a very brief introduction. I'll say, as I said, I, I, I got to know Thomas Frank through the Baffler and, um, and, and, and all of his writings. And then, and then What's the Matter with Kansas really, I think, kind of set, set a larger stage nationally. And um, if it's, if it's fair to say this also by way of introduction, I, I would share, a, I think by now, apocryphal story about um, reading What's the Matter with Kansas at a reference desk in Los Angeles. Um, I don't know if this is true, but I have decided that this really happened. It, it, who, wait, who did it happen to? Who did it? I was the library. Oh, what happened to you? I, was, uh, I, I worked at the Los Angeles Public Library, and um, you're not really supposed to read at the desk, but I did. I was not the most customer-focused librarian. It was a slow Saturday, and I was, what's the matter with Kansas come out, and I was reading it. And uh, I was reading it, and a woman came up to me, and she said, I'll tell you what's the matter with Kansas. This is in the Pacific Palisades, um, if you know anything about Los Angeles. This is north of Santa Monica. It's pretty hoity-toity part of town. Um, and I said, oh, I mean, I folded the book and, and set it down. And I was like, please do tell me what is the matter with Kansas? I don't think she knew where I was from, obviously, Topeka, Kansas. Um, 
And she said their problem with the, what's the matter with Kansas is that everybody there is stupid. Oh. And, and I said, oh. uh, I would tell you, and this is my reading on what's the matter with Kansas. You can tell me how poor my reading on it is. I said, actually what the matter of Kansas is, is you and your attitude and that a Kansan would do anything to spite you because of the way in which you act as an elitist asshole. Um, and so without further ado, I would introduce the author of What's the Matter with Kansas and the inspiration for um, the way I live my life as a Kansan, Thomas Frank. Thanks so much. for Brad, being it's my pleasure. And I, and I should also point out that I believe I sent you, uh, you got one of the very first copies of it. Didn't you get one of the advanced reader copies? I, I believe that's before it was before COVID. And so I had, I had been planning this big book tour and you, you came to me, you were like the very first uh, reader who came to me and said, you got to come to the, the Lawrence public library. And then everything got canceled. The book got delayed because we didn't know what was going on. That was back in like March or February or something. Yeah, like It was a long time ago. I was looking, I was looking um, for my copy in case I wanted to look at it a little bit more. And it was, it was, so those are those are extremely rare. There there were only something like ten copies in existence uh, the, of the advanced reader. Anyhow, yeah, no, I have a I have an electronic one. And, oh, uh, okay. It was I think the the my most recent and quite long ago tweet was about the word blatherskite, which is at the very beginning. <laughs> <laughs> one of those great 19th century words. I should also just clarify about the big hurt on the south side of Chicago. That's a baseball player for the White Sox named Frank Thomas. And I used to live in the south side of Chicago. That's where we did the Baffler magazine. I lived on 48th Street and kids would write. He was, you know, he was a great uh, baseball star and kids would write letters to him, but they wouldn't know his address or anything. They just write, you know, Frank Thomas, Chicago, Illinois. And I would get his mail because they, they knew who I was. Right. So they would just bring it to me. And so that's always been kind of a, a running joke. And, uh, you know, people have confused us ever since me and Frank Thomas. It's understandable. It's understandable. <laughs> and yeah, so this book, uh, the people know it. It does. It does have a lot of Kansas uh, shout outs. It's a lot of Kansas centric stuff. And the, I think the story that we should start with uh, is, well, okay. So the book starts with you know all of these people using the word populism now as a really negative thing, as a terrible thing, a thing you you that we have to stamp out. This attitude, this anti intellectual kind of racist, kind of bigoted, kind of authoritarian attitude that's, that's spreading around the world. And we have to do something to stamp out populism. We have to make people respect rightful expertise again. And every, every time I, I would see this, you know, beginning about 2016, every time I would see the word used in this way, it would just, it would just make me, you know, as a Kansan, get so annoyed. You know, it's like, wait a minute, I know what populism is, and that is not it. That's not even, that's not even close to it and it, it turns out and this uh, you know of course i can't stop the way words change the way, you know mutability of language you know it just goes on and on and on and today that is almost universally the way the word is used but when you go back and dig into this literature that's and it's it's largely a scholarly literature you know they have their uh, name for this discipline now they call it global populism studies you know how these things they grow and uh you know and uh, and, and, and develop disciplinary boundaries and do all this stuff very, very quickly nowadays. But if you, if you dig into their literature, they often, they're, they're weirdly incurious about where the word itself comes from. Well, they're not curious about American populism at all, but they're even less curious about where the word comes from. And that was kind of a, a, a that was a, for me, that's a red flag. I'm like, aha, let's look into this. And so I did. And uh, Brad, that train, that beautiful uh, locomotive from about 1880 that you've got behind you there on the screen, that's where the word was in. Okay, not really. The, what I discovered in my research is that the word was invented on a train traveling between Kansas City and Topeka, probably a train very much like that one. And this uh, is, uh, Atchison, Santa Fe. This is, I got this. Oh, right. so that, that, oh, so that has a good chance of being it. I mean, yeah. It is the Cyrus Holiday train. Um, from from that railroad. So whether it's the exact one, one couldn't say, but it's from that era and the right railroad line. Yeah, that's right. And so this was in 1891, and they were looking for a name for followers of supporters of this new political party. It was the la it was a third party. 
It was the last great third party in American history uh, that had just sprung up in Kansas the year before. Uh, it was brand new at that point, and it had they had elected they had uh, uh, basically uh, taken the the state legislature away from the Republican Party in an overwhelming way. And they would go on to elect governors, U.S. senators, members of Congress, uh, not just from Kansas, but from Nebraska, from uh, the Dakotas, Idaho, Colorado, and places in the South, Texas, stuff like that. Populists all over the place. Anyhow, that's, that's the people who invented the word and what they meant by it. And this is, the, the, this is sort of the point of beginning of the book. What they meant by it is exactly the opposite of the way the word is used today. And so then I've got a mystery that I'm trying to understand. How did this word get flipped? And what are the, you know, who flipped it? Why'd they do it? Why did it catch on? And what are the implications of that? That we use a word, uh, what I, I have always thought to be kind of an awesome word, and that we're using it uh, entirely the wrong way. What are the implications of that? And that's what the book is about. It's about the populist tradition in this country beginning in the 1890s, but going up through the 1930s and the 1960s, these sort of wonderful moments where you have mass mobilization of ordinary working class people for, uh, for, for democracy, basically, economic democracy, civil rights, that sort of thing. And it's also about the people who, in all of these different stages of American history, hated and despised mass movements of ordinary people and sought to stamp them out. And that's what the book is about, uh, a history of populism and a history of people who hate populism. Where should we start, Brad? Well, it's a great question. I'm, I'm curious about that flip because I, you know, the, to me, you know, I, and I, I didn't know a tremendous about, amount about the People's Party. I just know of it from um, studies I've done in African American studies for grad school of the future. Oh, so you know about, but you know about that aspect of it. That's the part yeah. of it that nobody knows about. 1896, the fusion parties in North Carolina and massive race riots. And a lot of people don't know that history. And it's, to me, what the history, I don't know well enough that I'm intrigued by with the People's Party is the way that the Republicans sold out Reconstruction. You know, I mean, you have the Republicans, you have Reconstruction, you have Samuel Tilden and you have Rutherford yeah. B. Hayes and they just, the Republicans just kind of give the, they just give it back and they, yeah. they give the South back. And then you have the vestiges of a Republican party fighting against that. You have Grant fighting against that biography of Grant. I found really interesting the way he really struggled with this during reconstruction. Well, no, that I'm getting, and then, and then it just ends. And then you have, yeah, and then you that, then you have a kind of a uh, an unending disaster for decades and decade and decade and decade. And the in, so American historians used to uh, of the South like C. Van Woodward were particularly fond of populism because it was the one bright spot in all those decades of awful Southern history from the end of Reconstruction up to the 1960s. This was the one moment. In, uh, in the history of the South where, where uh, working class whites, meaning farmers, you, mostly tenant farmers, reached out to their black counterparts, to black farmers who are in the same situation and said, hey, wait a minute, if we get together, we're an overwhelming majority. At the time, in the 1890s, blacks could still vote in most of the states in the South. And, uh, and for very, very briefly, they tried to join forces and sort of overthrow the Southern aristocracy, they, uh, what they used to call the Bourbon Democrats. And as you just pointed out, it, they, uh, they failed almost everywhere, not because they didn't have the numbers, but because they were, uh, they were cheated. The one state where they did come out on top was North Carolina, but it ended in a, in a horrible way. And in all of the Southern states, it ended when they decided to disenfranchise black people to make sure it was either as a reaction to populism or as a delayed reaction to populism to make sure that something like this never happened again. And uh, uh, that stood up until the civil rights days of the 1960s. It's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing little chapter of American history that is not widely studied. By the way, I, my, my feeling about it is it's not studied because it's so unpleasant to read about. It ends, you know, starts out so hopefully and it ends so uh, dreadfully 
you know, with, with riots and violence and, and paramilitary gangs. And uh, they overthrew an elected city government in Wilmington, North Carolina. I bet you know that. You're probably the only person I've talked to who does know that. But I think we should stick with Kansas for now, where it was a much more hopeful thing and had, and had, and, and had a lot, met with a lot more success. Although there it also got beaten down. You know, and, and I'm intrigued by that, you know, by this, this sense of how, you know, and, and how the, the People's Party wrestled that power away from the Republicans. You know, I mean, that was the party that, you know, free soil, all these things. And then, you yeah. know, at what point does the Republican Party start to tilt towards big business and... Oh, and, come on, you know uh, when. Immediately once Lincoln is gone. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so you know how you get this, this yeah. situation that, that they can have this massive revolt. I mean, it's really incredible and it's and it hasn't happened since, as you say. I mean it's Yes, it's well there've really been there've been there've been similar efforts. We'll talk about this, but the it, it happened because they organized the farmers. The farmers got uh you know, in that great 19th century kind of civic participatory, you know, uh, way, the farmers in Kansas were having a terrible decade in the 1880s. Uh, farm prices just kept going down and down and down and down. And they would, uh, they, they would do as they were told, you know, like produce as much as you can. And you know what that leads to is just more overproduction. The prices go lower and lower to the point where in 1890, people are burning ears of corn as fuel. And they, uh, they, there's this group called the Farmers Alliance comes out there and organ starts organizing them and says, if we get together and educate ourselves, we can make a difference in our lives. And uh, the people signed up for it, uh, like by the millions all over America, but especially in places like Kansas and Texas. And they organized. It wasn't it wasn't secret or anything, but they, uh, you know, they uh, they organized in out of the way places. Like they would hold their meetings in, um, you know, in in those one the classic Kansas one-room schoolhouses out on the prairie and stuff like this. Anyhow, there's uh, one of the things I discovered when I was writing this, Brad, is uh, there's novels and novellas, uh, uh, there's fictional treatments of populism from the period that are not, well, no one reads anymore. And they're not even, as far as I can tell, there's not even any scholarship about them. There's this guy, Hamlin Garland, wrote one and I think two novels uh, where uh, about populism. One of them is set in Kansas. William Allen White, who uh, coined the phrase, what's the matter with Kansas, who was an arch anti-populist, really despised the populist movement, wrote a novella of it that came out in uh, 1899 or in 1900. And I went and found this and it's about Kansas. It's very thinly disguised. And it's 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 very well written. He was a wonderful writer, but uh, it, the the whole idea of it is, a kind of mental illness takes over the state and it's really hard to understand it. And, and, but all of these people who are losers, life's losers, you know, uh, 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 lawyers who have no clients, teachers who have no students, he goes down the list. And one of them is like a kind of street corner troublemaker from some small town. Uh, and uh, they, they, these people by, you know, this weird, uh, uh, you know, twist of fate all get put on top and the and the street corner troublemaker gets elected governor of Kansas and he's a he's supposed to be a spellbinding orator and white describes his the way he when he gives these speeches how uh, people are 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 charmed like the way a uh, uh, a python charms a chicken, you know, or <laughs> something like that. It's this incredible it's this vision of populism as 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 mental illness as as mass hypnotism and uh, uh, it's you know completely forgotten today. But anyhow, that's that's the sort of beginning of how the word was flipped. We never did talk about the the. Uh, did we talk about the train? We did talk about the train. Yeah. The, yeah. Did you want to know how I found that story? It's yeah. kind of interesting. So it is referenced in a uh, a, a book of like a, a Kansas encyclopedia that came out in the 1920s. There's an article in this encyclopedia about the days of the people's of, of the populist party. And in the course of that, he mentions this happening and he references a story in the Kansas City Times. OK, I'm like the Kansas City Times. So I got in touch with the uh, with the very excellent people at the Kansas State Historical Society. And they're like, well, we don't have that particular story, but we do have this file folder about the origins of the word populist. And they they uh, they they photocopied it, sent it to me. And it was there are all these stories from the Kansas City Star and from other Kansas City newspapers about this this uh, fateful train ride, because apparently 
one of the people in the conversation where they made up the word was this reporter for the Kansas City Star. And he, I, I guess, dined out on it for the rest of his days. And so every 10 years or so, the Kansas City Star would run another story about this, you know, on, on a, you know, a day when there's a slow news day, they would pull it out and run it again. And it'd be like, where the populist party got its name? And, <laughs> and they ran these up into the 1940s. And then I think the guy died. Oh, yes, that's right. He did. I have, I have his obituary somewhere. And it's in his obituary, too, his claim to fame. He was in the conversation where this word was, was coined. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's an amazing story. And so I found that out. And then I'm like, well, where did it first appear in print? And, the, you know, the Internet is such an amazing thing, Brad. When I first studied populism back in the 1980s, I, uh, you had to read everything on microfilm and it was really difficult and it was unpleasant and it took forever and you'd get easily distracted and you'd read the stories that you weren't supposed to be reading and that sort of thing. And it's all online today, all those old populist newspapers. And not only are they online, you can do text searches. Now they're not very, they're not completely accurate, but I knew once I got in the neighborhood, I would be able to find it. And I was able to find its first, the words first appearance in print. And these guys knew that they had uh, a winner on their hands. It was in a newspaper called The American Nonconformist and Kansas Industrial Liberator. Came out of Winfield, Kansas. By the way, the editors of it were sons of a famous abolitionist. There were a lot of abolitionists in the early days of populism because they figured it was the next step. You know, they'd, done, they'd been through abolitionism and this was the next reform step. And Kansas was... was chock a block with ab old abolitionists, you know. And so, yeah, they were signing up for this thing. Anyhow, the day after it appeared in, in, in the American Nonconformist, it appeared in another little newspaper. I've got it on my computer here somewhere. It's in, from a tiny little town. And they made it this huge headline populist exclamation point. Are you a populist? This is how the word was born. Uh, it's it's kind of awesome, and then to think that now it's like used to describe Marine Le Pen and uh, you know Jair Bolsonaro and uh, and uh, all of these scoundrels all around the world. But it comes from us. It comes from Kansas. It comes from that locomotive you you've got on, on your screen. Right, and I think you know, and it's and I think having grown up with well. Having you know learned learned about some of these movements and and learned about movements in the '30s and um, knowing some bit about history, you know, I mean, I yeah, I've I've never I've never understood you know how this word got hijacked either. Like I've always thought of it, you know, as well. You came to the right place, my brother. I'm here to tell you why. No, I, no, and I I think it's you know as I was I was watching rewatching the talk that you gave at Kansas City uh, Public in 2017 on YouTube. I'm that's something I'd like to talk about a little bit later is kind of the migration and tie in from listen liberal to kind of the evolution of this book. And you started talking about the populist movement in that talk and you could kind of see how it was already threading through. I don't, you know, and, and I was curious to talk about kind of the conception when you started writing this, but yeah, I mean, it's, when did the people, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated with the way that maybe in which who the elites are has Yes. Yes, that's well, exactly right. But do you, you remember a second ago I was talking about William Allen White and his yeah. his take on populism. He was he really liked a book. Here, I've got it all right here. He really liked a book called The Crowd by Gustave Le Bon. This yeah, is an yeah. early book of social psychology. Uh, Gustave Le Bon was a French social theorist who hated democracy. And his, his big idea, what he gave to the world, was this notion that when people assemble in crowds, they become subhuman, and they are easily swayed by clever orators. And uh, it was sort of the beginning of mass psychology. And William Allen White uh, 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 looked at populism and said, that's what's going on here. He, uh, he, he recounts in his memoirs reading uh, Gustave Le Bon at the same time in 1896 and saying, wow, you know, this is... So he clearly put two and two together and came up with this judgment on what populism was, that it was a kind of mental illness. And um, 50 years later, famous historian named Richard Hofstadter comes along. And I feel like we're skipping a lot here. And we are, we're skipping all kinds of the, some of the best stuff in the book, but, but I'm, what the hell? Let's just go with it. 
a, a historian called Richard Hofstadter comes along and says, World War II is over, the labor movement has, has come and gone, the 1930s, the great decade of the common man is over. And it's the, uh, it's the 1950s, it's the great heyday of managerialism. It is the organization man, you know, the man in the gray flannel suit. It is the, de the heyday of the IBM computer. <laughs> And uh, Hofstadter is writing, this is the, he belonged to a generation of intellectuals they call the consensus intellectuals. And they believed that there never really was any real conflict in American life, that Americans have always agreed with one another on the most basic things. And so the consensus intellectuals tended to look at social protest movements as the, there's something wrong with them. And they, uh, Hofstadter wrote a famous book in 1955 called The Age of Reform, where he, uh, he went after populism, and he described it in exactly the way that William Allen White had done, and exactly the way that the newspaper cartoons of the era did, and the way the Topeka newspapers did, the way people who hated populism in the 1890s described it. Okay, they would describe it as, as mental illness, anti-intellectualism, a kind of weird superstitious behavior. And above all, it is a case of the riffraff trying to grab control of society from the rightful ruling class. It's always that this notion of the, uh, you know, the, this topsy-turvy world turned upside down. That's, what, that's how the people who hated populism described it in the 1890s. And what Hofstadter did in the 1950s was take that description and, and basically rewrite it in the psychological jargon of the 1950s. And uh, he, by the way, never acknowledges in the age of reform that he's doing that. He never acknowledges any of those sources. It's as though he's come up with this interpretation all on his own very, very brilliantly. And the book is a monster success. It gets the Pulitzer Prize. It's a bestseller. And it's, uh, uh, it has been described as the most influential work of American history ever written. You know, this book where he does this number on populism. And it catches on in, a, in an incredible way. And all of the consensus generation, all of these other intellectuals, start using the word populism as a generic term for proto-fascism. And they use it to describe Joe McCarthy. Uh, they use it to describe, well, basically any kind of uh, uh, outbreak of, you know, uh, uh, you know sort of right-wing uh, craziness becomes populism. And uh, here's the, the punchline of this. So Hofstadter was wrong. His famous interpretation of populism was wrong. I mean, I don't mean that his individual facts were wrong. He, he you know, he he did his research and, and it was there, but he took things out of context. He cherry picked his evidence, et cetera, et cetera. And and other uh, historians who were familiar with populism with the 1890s movement said, you know, refuted him in, in a kind of a, a crushing way. There's a famous book about Kansas history. I'm sure you know it. It's called The Tolerant Populists. And it came out in, I think, 63, uh, written by Walter Nugent. And it's a study of Kansas populism that I think he's refuting a single paragraph or something in Hofstadter. It's like 200 pages long. And it's just, it's absolutely devastating. It's just, it's crushing. He goes like county by county in Kansas. And he's like, you know, no, they weren't xenophobic because this county chairman came from Denmark and this county chairman came from Ireland. And there are all these immigrants that they were giving speeches to it. And he does it with this granular a reading of the Kansas source material. And it's, it's, a, it's also a pleasure to read, but there were several other books like this refuting all the different elements of Hofstadter's take on it. For example, Hofstadter also said populism was anti-Semitic and not just anti-Semitic, of course, there were anti-Semites among the populace, but he said it was the main source of anti-Semitism in American life, which is anybody that studied the 19th century can tell you is flatly wrong, you know, completely untrue. And he, he got spanked for that too. Uh, he got spanked for many different things, but nobody remembers that. Nobody remembers any of that. Instead, they remember that this word, the way that he recast this word as a synonym for proto-fascism. And it caught on and it conquered the world and, uh, you know, nobody wanted to hear the, 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 you know, the contrary opinion, the reality of it. And uh, today there's, like I said, there's an entire academic pedagogy that is, that, that takes its, uh, you know, that takes its, that starts 
with Richard Hofstadter's redefinition of populism. And no, they're not interested in the fact that the word, that they've misappropriated the word. And uh, this is fascinating to me. And I, I'm sorry, I, I tend to go on about these things too much. Here's why it's fascinating. Because when Hofstadter did this, he wasn't just, you know, saying something mean about some guys in the 1890s that he didn't know. He wasn't just saying something mean about some distant people. He was writing a manifesto for his generation and for their new political vision. This is a political vision in which the way you make reform, remember the title of his book is The Age of Reform. It's a book about reform, uh, how you get reform, what reform looks like. And the argument is that movements like populism or movements like organized labor are not how you do it. You don't want to get you know, millions of working class people together and let them, you know, uh, agitate for reform and try to get it because they're crazy and they'll do stupid things. And they, you know, you put, it's like the crowd. It's like Gustav Le Bon. Again, they'll, they'll do insane things. You do not want that. What you want are leaders. You want intellectuals. You want highly educated people who these groups choose and they go to Washington and they sit around a table in Washington and they decide and they manage and that's how you get prosperity. This was the great belief of the 1950s to manage, you know, that if we have all these economists sort of uh, at the controls in Washington, they can deliver prosperity forever. And they can run the Pentagon very smoothly. You don't need the generals anymore. You need, you know, Robert McNamara. And you have MBAs running the great corporations. And that's how it should be working. And so it, what, every time you hear the word populism used in this way, that's the flip side of it. That's what they mean. They mean this is how you're supposed, this is how society is supposed to be run by elites, a specific kind of elite, managerial elites. But see that see, and now that 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 makes me think about listen liberal, and it makes me think about, you know, is this is this kind of the pedigree of the new democrats and neoliberalism and yeah. Then you know, connected it back to that. It's really interesting because to me, that's the you know what I find so compelling about this, and and I, I don't you know is is being for me at least being a Kansan and being a Kansan with a father from Mississippi who can is you know can read the newspaper, but you know I mean I, I I've tried to give him he can't read your books. That's I'm not trying to say anything bad about my dad. It's just like he he didn't grab you know he, you know he's watching Brad. He is like he. My mom was watching the other time. She's like, "Why'd you say that?" I said something that they that they took is not nice about them, but um, but it's not. You know, he didn't get a proper education. That's not his fault. He's a brilliant person, but he struggles to read, right? Yeah. And, um, and he's like, millions and he, of people like that. And he, and there's and the, so I'm know, sorry. Go ahead. Year he became a manager, and he understood this is the path. You get an education. You do these things, and this is how. You become successful and I bought into that you know and I, I think a lot of people do and it, and so I I'm fascinated by this book and by what's going on with Democrats because I think we're having this this real push and pull between it's funny because it's so relevant it goes you know? on it goes on all the time it goes on all around us we, we argue about these things every day like right now in the in the coronavirus uh, the all these people you know, I, I drove through Kansas just the other day, and there's all sorts of people not wearing masks. And they say it's about personal freedom. And then you listen to Nancy, and I wear a mask. Here it is. And, there, and then you listen to Nancy Pelosi, and she says, no, you got you to gotta listen to experts. You got to do what experts say. And I hear these two points of view, and I'm like, there's all this stuff that we're leaving out. Of course, we should listen to experts, but experts should also listen to us. You don't just put experts in charge. You know, there's so many examples of these guys screwing things up, you know. Uh, uh, I mentioned Robert McNamara, and I, I, always, I always throw him out there because everybody remembers what he did, his great legacy, the Vietnam War, which was dreamed up by a bunch of political scientists who refused to listen to non-expert opinion. The Iraq War, same deal. The, uh, the, the, the subprime disaster, which is up until this pandemic, I always thought was going to be the, you know, the worst thing that ever happened to my generation, you know, the subprime disaster and the, and the recession that, that, that came out of it. That was all done by, by uh, you know, by, by professionals. 
you know, and by people on Wall Street, by, by bankers, by the, the pillars of their community is who did that. And then they got bailed out by the experts in Washington and they, uh, who also made sure that there were no consequences for them. And you go right down the list, the, uh, uh, the opioid epidemic. That wasn't you and me. That was, that was, that was people who can write prescriptions. We're doing, we're, you know, we're dreamed that baby up and people who make, you know, pharmaceuticals. And all the different failures of the Obama administration were, you know, not failures, but the half measures were always the, you know, trying to do other favors for other members of the professional elite. And um, what you finally realize, I mean, this is, you don't finally realize it, it was in Listen Liberal, I realized it many years ago, is that the Democratic Party regards these people as its number one constituency. And, you know, the, listening to experts is, is, is what they do. That's who they are. And what I'm here to tell you is that there is more to democracy than that. If you listen to experts, the problem is that experts act in their own interests. They act as a class. It's for whatever reason, it's extremely hard for us to understand this, that they are not looking out for us necessarily. I know they say they are and they're supposed to be, but they also look out for themselves. And so classic example, this is one that I just keep thinking about again and again and again, the healthcare system in this country. Why is it so screwed up, Brad? It's one of the reasons is because there have been all of these different reform efforts, populist reform efforts over the years, some of them masterminded by groups like the Farmers Union, some of them you know, proposed by people like Harry Truman, and they've been stopped at every turn by a group called the American Medical Association. The experts, the professionals, the scientists who are like, well, no, that, I, don't, I don't want that happening. They like having a monopoly on, on expertise in this field. They don't want you know, the government getting in there and, and providing it to everyone and you know, turning out med making medicine into a human right. Hell no. That's what happens when you just blindly listen to experts all the time. The same thing with the financial crisis, but I've said, I've said enough. <sighs> I, talk, I just talk too much. No, I think I think these are powerful points because I, you know, and 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 to me, why you know I'm trying to, as you know, you know, one of the questions that you know that I was trying to to think about is, you know, you 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 said from the very beginning you're talking about the mutability of language, and it's like, so you might think, okay, well, so what? This word used to mean this, now it means that. That happens all the time, right? But, of course. But yeah. but the argument in your book is that there is something at stake here, something that happens. Some, something that happened in the 1890s, something that happened in the 1930s. You're reading this book. I, I have to say, I don't really know enough about FDR. You know, I, I know just, a, I didn't realize how he was not endorsed by any newspapers that they, you know, like. Yeah, that know, they hated him. They hated him. You know, I mean, it's fascinating. I didn't understand all of these things that were against him. I thought it was just landslide, you know. Yeah. You know, because I, you know, I, I buy, I buy into the New Deal. I think it's important. I think that these, this was, these were some of the last. Well, uh, Brad, nobody knows those uh, stories anymore. That's why I wrote it. I, 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 in fact, it's not clear to me that 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 anybody knows knew the, that those stories were immediately forgotten and haven't been widely written about. And so, you know, we know that FDR, that the business community hated him. And we know that the newspapers were against him. What we didn't know, what no, I didn't know anyways, was the texture of their hatred, the words that they used, the ways that they despised him. And once you start digging into it, it's the exact same stuff that you see in 1896 against populism. You see the same arguments rolled out against the New Deal. They, they, they called it an uprising of the unfit. You know, this idea that lazy people, you know, people who were, uh, there was something wrong with them. They were just workers, you know, were trying to vote themselves money out of the pockets of their, their bosses, of their masters. And there's, again, with like Gustave Le Bon, you have, you know, all this, side, this sort of social theory about crowds. In the 1930s, you have eugenics. There's all of this eugenic theory that is mixed into the uh, the, to the, the pushback against the New Deal, which I did, I had no idea I was going to find and was shocking when I did find it because it's fascist. There was, there was like people who were real close to fascism in this country who hated Franklin Roosevelt and hated the New Deal and owned newspapers, you know, and went up against him. I'm going to tell you one anecdote and then we'll go on to something else. Uh, uh, after 
the dust settled. So this was 1936 was the year when this happened, when the biz, big business put together its big, its, its huge front group to stop the New Deal. And all the newspaper editors of America signed on, and, or newspaper publishers, I should say, signed on. And we're going to war with Roosevelt in this most, the most extreme fashion. And um, when the dust had settled and Roosevelt had won the greatest landslide in American history against these people, they're like, what the hell went wrong? What happened? You know, what did we do? And uh, someone was writing about this and said, you know, one of the interesting things is in cities, back then cities used to have more than one newspaper, like Chicago had six papers. In, in cities where there were no newspapers on Roosevelt's side, that's where he got his largest majorities. And so the argument was people weren't just voting for him in the New Deal, although, of course, they were. People liked things like Social Security. You know, they liked the WPA. They liked having a job. You know, they liked economic recovery. People were voting for that. But they were also voting against the newspapers. This is a lesson we should have learned in 2016. People really hate that crap. You know, when all of these news, when all the newspapers get together and they agree with one another on everything and they, you know, uh, uh, and they and they speak in this way that they're just determined not to listen to anybody outside of their bubble. That's not very attractive. And this is a lesson that I guess was learned in 1937 and then instantly forgotten. And there are many little incidents like that in the course of the book where you can see these things cropping up again and again and again, and very relevant to our own time. I mean, all of these echoes of what's going on today. No, I, I was I was trying to think about you know how to how to bring this back to today. Today, you know, I mean, like one thing I was really wondering too, and I I think um, you know I did I. I uh, you know, what would be, you know, you, 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 you bring it up somewhat kind of more near the end of the book. Like, what would you, you know, what would be a more proper term for this, you know, from what has been renamed populism, you know, for, these, it, for the right wing. Yeah. For, for, for these things, you know what I mean? Like uh, other than fascism. So I used to call it, I used to call people like Ronald Reagan uh, and Newt Gingrich and Trump fake, po fake populists because they do this, this act you know, they do deliberately echo the sort of uh, uh, reform language of the past. They do it on purpose. Uh, uh, Steve Bannon does it. Steve Bannon is actually, he's one of the most interesting, uh, one of the bunch, does it deliberately. And there's all of these people who were comparing uh, uh, Trump to William Jennings Bryan, which is just like, it, it boggles the mind, but they were doing it. And uh, they, and you know, I was there in the, in the convention hall in Cleveland in 2016, when Trump gave a shout out to the forgotten man, you know, which is a line directly from Franklin Roosevelt. Yeah. And uh, th so they do this all the time. They use workerist language all the time. I mean, the Republican, uh, these Republican thinkers now are openly saying the Republican Party is going to be a workers party, which again boggles the mind. You can't believe what that you what you're hearing. But uh, uh, another word that they used to use in the 1930s when they would be describing, de well, demagogues is a good word. Uh, and there's, you're from, Miss, your, your family's from Mississippi. There used to be a term that they would use back in those days, just simply Southern demagogue. And it meant a, a uh, it meant a George Wallace kind of guy, a race baiter who would pretend to be down with ordinary people. That was called, that was not called populism. People knew, what, no, populism was something different. A, a demagogue was these, these kind of, these racist guys. And uh, so there's that, that, that term, demagogue, but there's another term they used in the 30s that's more alarming, and that is uh, uh, pre-fascist, or we would say today proto-fascist. And they would use that to describe someone like William Randolph Hearst or Father you know, Charles Coughlin, a radio. He was a viciously anti-Semitic radio uh, priest back in the 1930s. And both of these guys flirted more or less openly with the Nazis. So, you know, calling them proto-fascist was not, <laughs> was not a, you know, it was not a long walk. It was, a, it was, a, it was a, you know, very easy to connect the dots. I think that with a lot of this, uh, you know, people talking about the new right in, uh, in Europe, in South America and stuff like that, they don't want to use that word because uh, it, it, it's too loaded for them. And, uh, you know, to, to compare someone, to call someone a fascist, you're going to make them real mad. 
but you can call someone a populist and the actual populists are long gone, you know, and the only people who still take umbrage at it are people like me. So, you know, what the hell? And, and by the way, Brad, I am not under the illusion that I can single-handedly rescue the word, you know, from, from, its, from it, it being it stolen and taken away from us. I don't think I can, but I can trace the way it changed. And that's fascinating. And I can, more importantly, trace the lineage of anti-populism over the decades. This is something that I, I don't think anybody has, has tried to do before. And it, it begins with those people hating and denouncing populism in the 1890s. And it ends with those people today who also denounce and hate populism and, and use the word in exactly the same way. And now today they're talking about Donald Trump. Now this does not, I'm, when I say this, I'm not, I don't mean that I'm a fan of Donald Trump. You've probably gathered that. I'm not, didn't vote for him, don't like him. <laughs> <laughs> don't have a lot of use for him. In fact, I'm, I'm, I'm rather, you know, worried about him. But nevertheless, when they use the word in that way, and you look at the stereotype that they're building, it's the same stereotype that was used really unfairly against the populists in the 1890s. There's this continuity. The only difference is, I mean, the, well, there's a lot of differences, but the only real big difference is that what was once on the, uh, anti-populism was a phenomenon of the right wing of people who believed in the gold standard, who owned the banks, owned the newspapers, owned this country. Today, it's a phenomenon of the center left, of the sort of uh, 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 the clever people on Twitter, uh, the, the sort of uh, uh, you know, Democratic Party professional class uh, apologists. Whew. Well, that's, that, that's the book in a nutshell. There you go. Well, what it, what it makes me think, you know, what I, I would really be curious to, to ask you is, you know, we're coming up on this election, right? I mean, that's that's obvious do you think i mean do you, or do you have any sense or of of seeing the democrats at some point attempt to reclaim populism and be the people's party again or not you know i mean how is how do you see the way that people talk about being for the people as you say trump had done you know i mean like i would yeah. watch this stuff and you could see it work um Oh yeah, he was, he's very good at it. You know what I mean? Like you say, like you, you know, as I said, I was, you know, you, you uh, talked about his, his talk at the Republican convention. If you listen to it and don't know who he is. It sounds good. Like, hey man, yeah, I want that. Yeah, I want, I want <laughs> Cleveland. Wait, wait a minute. The slogan and all the, all the Democrats were all supposed to laugh at it. Make America great again. Who doesn't want their country to be great? Who doesn't want their, their sad town to be improved? You know, it's, it's, and yes, it's nostalgic. Reagan said the same thing. And by the way, uh, Joe Biden is now basically running on the same thing. I'm, he's going to make America great again by going back to the Obama years, you know. They're both <laughs> arguing for this. It's, uh, anyhow, they, what, what, where are they going? The, uh, the Democratic Party has let, like, I thought 2008 was the great populist moment of our lifetimes. And Obama let it slip through his fingers. He had the populist momentum. He had the crowd. God, he had that movement behind him. He was beloved. He could have had anything he wanted, and he let it slip away. And that that really was a moment that made me think that they they're really not interested in that kind of mobilization. And you you take a guy like Bernie Sanders, who is again who's uh, very uh, similar to the po clearly within the populist tradition, and they did everything in their power to stop that guy. Now, Joe Biden is an interesting man. I don't want to dump on him too much here. Um, I, in fact, I'm, we're, I, we should take questions from the audience. So I'm not going to dump on him at all. But Biden is, um, Biden can talk a populist game. He's kind of interesting in that respect, whereas a lot of the other candidates simply could not. Right. That's what I mean is like, is he, will he try to, can they wrestle this back? You know, and that's, that's he can beat I, he can beat Trump. Yes, I, but that's I, whether he he the thing is that's not enough. That's that's enough to win the election this time around. But that's not you know his he he's a friendly guy. He's got a nice smile. People in Pennsylvania and Ohio love him, and that might be enough to win the election. But sorry, that just puts off the day of reckoning by a little bit. And then you know the thing is, until we find a real solution to what ails us, and that solution should come, has to come from a real populist movement. Uh, this, this Trumpist phenomenon 
is going to continue and it is going to gain momentum. And, you know, just I, I want to shut up here, but imagine Trumpism in the hands of someone who's not a complete imbecile, who, who, who knows how to do politics, like Ted Cruz or something like that. That's going to be hard to stop. That's going to be hard to beat. Well, we do have, we have one question, and if, uh, I'm sorry, one question, and um, if you're in the audience and you want to ask a question, please just use the chat or the little Q&A button um, that's um, kind of in the, more towards the middle of the screen. But our question kind of uh, points to that. How should disappointed progressives vote or move forward in light of the Biden-Harris ticket? Oh, man. <laughs> Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, of course, I'm going to vote for for Biden, of course. But, and, and by the way, I say this: I'm here in Washington D.C. This town loves that man. Everybody in this town has met him, and they, people just like him. It's weird because I think he has a lot to answer for. I, I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of his legislative record, but uh, people in the people who've met him just they they think he's the most wonderful guy in the world, uh, and. Uh, <laughs> The, look, the answer to that question is the same answer as it's always been. Organize, organize. What populism is about, the real deal here, is about mass organizations of working class people. It's not just about leaders. It's not just about Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren. Uh, it's about building a movement. And building a movement is really hard. But that's ultimately the only way that you're going to get real change. That's how the farmers won. I mean, and they did win eventually. They did get what they what they were after eventually. Labor, they eventually got what they built the middle class society. The civil rights movement, look at what they did. I mean, they were cut short. You think what Martin Luther King was aiming for at the end of his life, what they called the freedom budget, a massive expansion of the, um, you know, of the of the federal government and it's sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, economic democracy. It would have been fantastic. You don't get those things without a mass movement behind you. And that has to be the task. That has to be the task. But damn, that's a huge task. <sighs> okay. Anybody else? Yeah. We Here, I, oh, okay. Go ahead, Kristen. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, everyone, can you compare and contrast progressives and populists? Yes. So the progressive movement, look, I use the word progressive sometimes to describe myself, but now these days when I want to really make people mad, I just call myself a populist. I was in France a while ago and I, uh, I the French, for whatever reason, like my books. And I was, um, they, they, what's the matter with Kansas actually does really well in France. And, uh, I was giving, I was talking there and, uh, and I, and I, at the end of it, they were like, they were asking me like, what are, what are your political views? And I, I basically said, look, I'm a populist. And there was this gasp, this audible gasp in the room, because to them, that just means, you know, this horrible thing. It means Marine Le Pen. And, and I was like, and I had to go through the whole explanation. And these were good people who, who, uh, you know, who liked my writing and everything, but they, they couldn't believe I would say that. <laughs> so I say it even more now. Now I just say it all the time. But uh, the progressive movement was, was different than populism because this was uh, sort of the original managerial movement. They had this idea that, that you, you, know, you, you put professionals in charge and that's how you make change. They, they were sort of the original proponents of that. And they had a strong uh, dislike or suspicion of mass democracy. The famous example here being, um, uh, oh, geez, I'm blanking on his name, Walter Lippmann, of course. Uh, but some of them, they, they did great things. They got the populist program passed, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, and then uh, Woodrow Wilson. And then, of course, Franklin Roosevelt got all the different elements of the populist program enacted into law. Uh, and we're not going to go into what those were here now, but they're, uh, they're pretty essential. One of them was votes for women, incidentally. Populists were the only major party of that time that had women leadership, especially in Kansas. You know that story, Brad? The, um, Mary Elizabeth Lease. Yeah, She's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this famous orator. It's funny, there's no recordings of any of these people. So we don't know what the effect, what it really sounded like, what it was like to be there. But she would go around the state giving these uh, stem winding uh, uh, speeches and apparently would get people really riled up. And she would say, uh, this is legendary, of course, we don't know really what she said, but she would say, what you farmers need to do is raise less corn and more hell. <laughs> that that was shocking at the time. <laughs> you know? 
Oh, so so is it easier for me to read you the questions? Or no, I can I can see them. I can see them. There's a uh, uh, there's a bunch here. Uh, here's one about the electoral college. So the uh, the electoral college is an is an interesting question because the suspicion of mass democracy goes back to the very beginning of this country. The founding fathers, with the partial exception of Thomas Jefferson, the founding fathers really didn't like democracy. They were, they were really worried about it. And they, they built in all of these uh, elements into the constitution to make sure that the people stayed under control. One of them is the electoral college. Another one was the, the, uh, that se the, the US Senate, which at the time went under the original constitution, senators were chosen by state legislatures. And this is one of the big populist issues of the 1890s was to do away with that and to have senators elected directly by the general public. But uh, the elect it's, it's highly ironic that we call Donald Trump a populist when in fact, if it hadn't been for the electoral college, it would have been a wipeout. <laughs> he wouldn't have even got close. Uh, he, was, he was elected president by, uh, by uh, the, the most unpopulist mechanism of them all, the electoral college. What can be done about that? Uh, the constitution needs to be uh, amended to get rid of the electoral college. There's no, no question about it. Let's see, what else have we got here? Do you ever, see, do you see that gaining any traction? Do you see that happening? Again, it takes a movement. All kinds of things are possible when you have a movement behind you. And, uh, you know, we, we often say it depends on the historical circumstances. You know, the 1890s were an unusual time, the 1930s unusual time, the 1960s. Yes, they were. But it also requires a movement. And once you have that movement, things become possible. You know, the 1930s is, it's, it's really rewarding to study this. Uh, you know, organized labor grew by a factor of three in the course of that decade, the, a depression decade, all of these people signing up for this, all sorts of things became possible. Uh, you also had the right leader at the time. You had Franklin Roosevelt and, you, you know, you had uh, the wonderful culture of the period. Uh, and so it was, uh, everything came together. Similarly, in the 1960s, until the Vietnam War came along and, and destroyed everything. But it can, it can happen again, but the key is the mass movement, in my opinion. Okay, what else we got here? What else we got here? Southeast Kansas is, oh, geez. Do I have any sense of how Southeast Kansas flipped from populist? Uh, it, it wasn't just populist, they, oh, the, as, the, as the anonymous attendee points out, uh, Southeast Kansas actually went for Eugene Debs for president. And I, th I believe the year was 1912. Uh, it's kind of a, a extraordinary. Debs was a populist who became a socialist. And Southeast Kansas looms large in my book, if you're from there and if you're interested in it, because of, here he pulls another interesting thing, a little relic off his shelf, the Little Blue Books, another great Kansas invention. This is the guy who basically invented the paperback from, lived in Girard, Kansas and ran a newspaper called The Appeal to Reason and uh, 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 developed this v extremely populist project of putting out classics of world literature and of science and stuff like that in ways that were easily accessible to anyone. They cost five cents. You'd send him a dollar in the mail and he'd send you back 20 of these things, you know, Goethe, Schopenhauer, <laughs> Einstein. Wonderful, wonderful project. How does a population like that flip? Do I have any sense of how that happened? Yes, there's a book about it. <laughs> it's called What's the Matter? I'm sorry. It's called What's the Matter with Kansas? Yes, I, my theory is that, uh, to go back to What's the Matter with Kansas, is that conservatives became expert at talking about class issues in a non-economic way. That's what the culture wars are. They sort of, they're, they're all class-based issues, but they're masquerading slightly. They're slightly concealed. Not that concealed. If you, if you scratch the surface, you'll, you, you, you get it instantly. If you talk to participants in the culture wars, you get it instantly. But conservatives have been dreaming up these working class, pseudo working class issues, non-economic class-based issues. And they were doing this at the very same time that the Democratic Party was turning its back on organized labor. And this is, that's the story of Listen Liberal. I didn't realize that the two things, that the culture wars launched at the same time as the Democrats did this until I started doing the research for Listen Liberal, but it is, it is quite uncanny. The, the Republicans are, um, 
I mean, let's just give them their due. They're extremely good political players. And a guy like Richard Nixon, advised, remember, by Pat Buchanan, they could see what the Democrats were doing, that the Democrats were turning their backs on organized labor and reaching out instead to students in the professional class. And they're like, this is our chance. This is our great opportunity. And they deliberately set out to court working class voters. And that's always been the secret from that day to this. And that's the secret of Trumpism. And that was the secret of George W. Bush. And that's the secret of what the awful thing that has happened to Kansas. Um, anyhow, I, I'm sorry, I, guys, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm about to faint. And I, I, <laughs> I've got a, uh, you know, a big bottle of bourbon in the other room that I just can't wait to, uh, to go speak, have a talk with. <laughs> Are there any other questions? I mean, the thing is, if we if we if we if we go on uh, too long, uh, <laughs> you know, I'll answer everybody's question, but I'll I'll I'll, uh, I'll 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 drop dead on the floor here. We can't have that. No, that would be bad. We we, we don't. Morris Public Library doesn't need that on our hands. We can call it. <laughs> yes. And it, yeah, hey, I, I, by the way, I really love that question about Southeast Kansas. Another, that's another, I went to Girard to do, or to Pittsburgh rather, to do my, uh, to do some research on the Little Blue Books. And they have a wonderful library down there at the, at Pittsburgh State. And they have, um, the, in, the, in their rare books room, they have this incredible collection on the Little Blue Books and on the Appeal to Reason, the newspaper that was published out of there. And it's absolutely fascinating, the history of that part of the state. Anyhow. It, it is. Uh, that's one of the, that end piece of the book about Gerard is, it's truly a fantastic piece of writing and it's a great conclusion to the book. Our, our mayor is from Gerard, actually. Is that right? Our current mayor, yeah. Um, we, I talked to her about the end of your book, actually, when I interviewed her. Um, so I was like, because everybody's like, well, you wouldn't know where I'm from. I'm from Gerard. Ah. Uh -uh. <laughs> the famous Gerard. Um, actually, our information services coordinator at the library is from Gerard. She's like, I'm. People say they're from Pittsburgh. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, two people I know from Gerard. Well, that's Great. amazing. And and uh, and the, the the publisher of the Little Blue Books led a really spectacular life, and he was personal friends with Debs, Clarence Darrow. And Carl Sandburg, who, who's who, the guy who I took the title of the book from. So it all comes together in Girard, Kansas. It's incredible. It's truly incredible. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's one thing. Yeah, I, I mean, I can't recommend this book enough to folks that are listening and may, may watch it later. That, that was something we didn't really even get into also is that, that sense of Carl Sandburg and, and so many, you know, like the people, yes, and all just this sense of what populism and, and, and democracy looks like you know yes. it's very powerful and it's something i think you're right that we've lost sense of that people want to claim that they love democracy but if you look at what they believe they don't they don't love democracy at all um uh, so but that's a whole other story you yes you love it or not but you know at least be honest about what you like and what you don't yes exactly Mr. Brad Allen, thank you very much for those kind words. And it's it's all in the book, by the way. All of the what what you were just describing. There's loads of it in there. You'll see. You'll see when you get a hold of it. Yeah, it's a great book for Kansans, really. Any, I mean, I, I really mean that. It's there. You know, it it uh, it it is kind of on either bookend of the book, and um, just some really great history that you've unearthed. So thank you so much. And it's really great to to get to talk to you. Um, in this our COVID. I know it's great to talk to you too. And I'm just, it's just, it's just the way this, you know, we're all hiding indoors during this disease and we never get to see anybody and I don't get to go on a book tour and I don't get to hang out in Lawrence, Kansas. And it's, it's, it's very depressing. And this has been a high point for me. So thanks for doing this. Incredibly grateful. Thank you for your time. All Do right. you have anything, Kristen, that you need to, to wrap up for us? No, I just want to plug the Raven again. Please order from the Raven. Um, check out my email. And we'll do those. We'll do those book plates. And yeah, let me know if you need book plates. Thank you all so they, much. They are our populist. They are our populist bookstore and great friends to the library. So buy with reckless abandon from the Raven <laughs> bookstore. All right, fabulous. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take good care. Right. Bye.